Hello and welcome to this video, The Definitive Guide to Learning the Blue Book. My name is Dean Warrington and I have been teaching, training and developing computer software and apps for the knowledge for the past 25 years. In this video, I want to give you a comprehensive step-by-step -step breakdown of every aspect you need to learn when doing the Blue Book runs. I want to show you the fastest, most efficient way to absorb vast amounts of information and get through step one of the knowledge as easily as possible. If you haven't applied yet, you need to. You need to get the application form in. This is a long-winded process and you're gonna need a criminal record check and a medical. And getting your application sorted is a major part of you getting through this quickly. In the eyes of the examiners, they want to see the day that you registered on the knowledge and it will count towards the time you've spent on the knowledge. So get this part out of the way as soon as possible. So let's start at the beginning. The very first thing you want to do is work out your time. Time management. How can you get the things done with the hours that you have? You cannot conjure up more hours in a day than there already are. Do not stress about what you cannot do. Just decide how much work you're going to do each week. Is your target to complete eight runs, 12 runs, or 16 runs a week? Hopefully it's 16 runs a week. So we'll go on that scenario, and you need to now work out where you can do those runs. Now you can do four runs a day, and those four runs are going to take you around about two hours to do. You're gonna allow about 30 minutes per run. That does not include the time it takes to drive to the run or from the run when it's finished, from the fourth run when you're finished and you wanna go home. So you're looking at somewhere between two hours to complete the four runs, so maybe three to four hours time slot that you need to go out and actually do these four runs. You need to do that four days a week. And if you can do that four days a week, you're gonna be doing 16 runs a week. And if you do that, you're gonna finish one book every five weeks, which means you will finish all four books in 20 weeks. That for me is the inspirational kind of target that I wanna aim for. I don't want to be seeing myself on the knowledge forever. I want to be having a nice, serious target that I can hit. You need to find out with the days that you have, how much of these runs can you do each week? If you want to do eight runs a week, that's quite easy. You just need two days a week to do it on. You do four on one day and four on the next, and then you've got a whole week to learn those runs and absorb those runs. I will be giving you the techniques on how you learn and absorb those runs, but the very first step is figuring out how much time a week you have and where you're going to do these runs and stick to it like a schedule of you going out religiously on these particular days during these set times that you're giving yourself to finish these runs and week in week out meeting those targets of trying to do 16 runs a week it's a very very important part of what you're doing because if you can do this if you can do 16 runs a week you will finish this aspect in 20 weeks and that allows you to then look at other aspects look at other things to study and change focus but if you can just stay focused for 20 weeks it's done Every time you miss a week, you're prolonging the time it's going to take you to complete this aspect. So time management, work out where you're going to do these runs. That's the very first aspect that we need to cover. One final thing when you're doing this study plan, don't be ashamed or afraid to start off doing one run a day. It's not easy when you first start. You are not in the frame of mind of remembering all this information. You're not in any sort of pattern that you feel comfortable with. So first of all, if you have to do one run today, Try to build up to two runs tomorrow or a couple of days time. Your aim is to try to build up to four runs a day. So don't feel that you have to go straight out and do four runs because as a complete beginner, that might be too difficult. But I can promise you, everybody can do it. You just need to know the steps to take to actually get to that stage. So once we get to the part of this video where we're telling you how to do the Blue Book runs, listen closely because that's how you are able to learn and absorb all the runs that you're attempting to do. One of the common mistakes when you first start is a misunderstanding of how you use a map when you're out on your bike. A popular misconceived idea is that you would have the map placed on your board displaying the route that you're about to drive. Now if you've ever used SatNav before you will know that it does not teach you or enable you to remember routes, but what it does do is allow you to get from A to B with as little concern as possible for remembering the route. Whereas prior to SatNav and prior to having a map on your board, the technique you would have used would have been to open your map book, have a look at the journey that you think you should use and attempt to remember key aspects of that journey so that you can relay them from memory. 
By doing this, you're actually activating your brain and attempting to commit to memory many of the key aspects of the route that you're using and trying to learn. Bear in mind that you are not trying to get from A to B as quickly or as easily as possible, but you're actually trying to commit to memory as much of the key aspects of the route as possible. This is achieved at a far greater rate if you use your map book or map app whenever you have a question about your journey or are puzzled by the route. You may even have gotten lost. Getting lost and understanding why you got lost is an integral part of developing your sense of direction and navigational skills. You will do plenty of looking at the map when you're home and studying and when you're doing point to point. So don't have a map on your board, carry it with you and use it to answer the questions as they arise. Very often you're going to hear people talk about visualization, the fact that you're supposed to visualize the route in your head. And there's a major problem with this because there is only two contributing factors to visualization. One is the amount of times you've been there. Quite simply, as a beginner, you haven't been there enough. The other is did anything memorable happen when you was there, which is quite rare. There won't be very much that's memorable when you was there. So the visualization aspect that really causes people a problem is when they start calling over, when they start reciting their runs, they're attempting to conjure up visual images in their head whilst they call the runs and those images are not there. And it affects the way that they call the run. Calling the run and saying the run fluently is your priority. Being able to say, leave by Matilda Street, right Copenhagen Street, left Caledonian Road, left Carnegie Street, right Muriel Street, forward Rodney Street. Being able to fluently say that with ease, without too much thinking, letting it flow. That's your priority. If you're saying it, but you're always attempting to conjure up a mental image of the street, you will be saying, leave by um, Matilda, uh, can't quite see it. Seeing it is completely and utterly unimportant because it takes care of itself in time. You will be there again. You will develop images over time, but initially you must not let that affect you being able to say the run. Saying the run is the be all and end all of what you're trying to do as a beginner. So don't worry about visualization. It takes care of itself. Don't attempt to visualize the run whilst you're calling it. Attempt to be able to say the run with the pattern, with a degree of fluency and with a degree of ease. That's the aspect you're trying to achieve. Now for the crux of this video. How do you learn each individual Blue Book run? First of all, prepare the runs that you want to do today. Get the four runs from either your paper printouts or your paper book or from the actual app screen. Look at the four runs you want to do. Get your A to Z Premier wall map, the whole map. You need to be looking at the whole map, not pages from a map book. Stare at the map, find the start point of the very first point you want to do that day and follow it through with your finger or with a dry white pen, drawing the route on. Do this for all four runs that you intend to drive that day. This is introducing you to the road you're about to learn, but more importantly, it's giving you the location of the runs in the overall view of London. This is going to help you with your sense of direction and give you an understanding of the position of these individual areas. Now look at the map and find the location of where you live. Look at the very first point and find its location and work out a very simple route from your home to the first point that you need to visit that day to start the runs. Look at the key areas you're going to pass on the way. Try to make the run use a route that you're kind of familiar with to some degree. You're not trying to learn the route. You're just trying to gain some sense of direction. Bear in mind that you're going to not have the map in front of you. So you're going to commit to memory these key elements. So when I'm looking at the map for this particular example, I'm looking to go through Victoria Park, through to Mare Street, up Amherst Road, Stoke Newton Church Street, and then I'll end up at Green Lanes. For me, that's good enough. If I get confused along the way, I will stop. I'll open up my map book. I'll read the map book and see why I'm confused. And then I'll carry on. Once I get to the start of the run, I take my map book out again. I take another look. I follow through the run with my finger. I'm looking at the turnings I want to take. You kind of start to begin to understand the more you do this, the distance you'll be traveling for each turning. And then you start driving. Drive the route slowly. Take your time. Look for the names of the roads you're about to turn into. So obviously on the first one, you need to look for Highbury New Park. As you're driving slowly through the route, if you notice any points of interest, take a casual look. 
Don't make any effort to remember it. Just rely on your subconscious to absorb it. If it does, excellent. It will absorb some information that you're not aware of. So later on, it becomes easier to learn. But for the moment, just take a glance, have a look and rely purely on your subconscious to absorb any information it wants. Remember that your focus is learning that run. If you try to distract yourself with other things, you are going to try to take on too much information. Everybody has a capacity of information to take on board every day. And for most people, four runs is at the limit of that capacity. Here's the key to learning runs well. Every four or five roads or so stop and revise and practice those four or five roads. Call them over, reach a degree of fluency. It's important that you attempt to learn the run whilst you're out there. Never postpone the learning. Never say that I'm going to go home and try and teach myself the run later. Do it while you're there. It'll help you with the understanding of that run and your memory of that run will be far greater. So you practice the run whilst you're there. Leave on left green lane, right Highbury New Park, left Highbury Grove, right St Paul's Road. Leave on left green lane, right and right Highbury New Park, left Highbury Grove, right St Paul's Road. Leave on left green lane, right and right Highbury New Park, left Highbury Grove, right St Paul's Road. You want to be able to call those four roads fluently before you move on to the next four. When you then move on to the next four, you call all eight roads and then you get to the end of the run and you call the whole run through from start to finish. As you're doing this, it's going to enable you to see and feel the run in segments. You'll see the first four, the second four, the third four and so on. So the run becomes compartmentalized and easier for you to call over. So drive four or five roads each time. Don't drive more than that. Stop and learn those roads. Leave on left green lanes, right and right Highbury New Park, left Highbury Grove, right St Paul's Road, left and right Highbury Corner, leave by Upper Street, right Barnsbury Street, left Milner Square, forward Milner Place, forward into Gibson Square. When you're revising, look at the run, read what you need to say and then look away. Don't hold your hand on the page and slide it down, uncovering each road at a time. Don't do that technique. That's using a visual memory trigger. You are not going to have that luxury. You want to use the sound memory trigger. You want to hear yourself say, leave on left green lanes, and that triggers the next words of right and right Harvey New Park. So don't do that technique of sliding your hand down the page. Once you've done that, you can now move on to run number two. You can look at your whiz links to give you a guide of how to get to run number two or just open your map book, figure out a route that you want to use to get to the beginning of run number two. You don't need to remember any of that. You're just using it as a basic learning that subconsciously you might absorb some of that information. But again, you must remember your focus. Your whole focus is trying to learn these four runs that day. Try it as little as possible to confuse yourself by taking on extra data. These four runs are going to be as much as you can cope with. Get yourself to the start of the next run and then follow the process the same. Drive four roads every time, stop at four roads and learn those four roads. Drive another four, add them together to make eight and call those eight roads. Get to the end of the run and make sure you can call the whole run through from start to finish nice and smoothly and fluently. If you can't, you stay there until you can. But before you move on to the third run, call the first run and the second run and see if you've got the fluency for both of them and then do the third run. Then do the fourth run. When you finish the fourth run, sit at the end of the fourth run. Don't go home and then tell yourself, I'm going to concentrate all on it later. You must do it there. It's the best time. You're going to sit now and be able to call all four runs from start to finish. And you should be relatively smooth at calling all four runs and then go home. When you go home, you now need to call all four runs again, hopefully with a partner. But if you haven't got a partner, you have to do it on your own. With a partner, anybody in the house who would sit and read those runs for you whilst you call them gives you the motivation to actually improve your standard. You should be able to call all four runs in under four minutes as a minimum standard, but hopefully you'll call all four runs in around two minutes. 30 seconds a run is a nice steady talking pace. Manor House Station to Gibson Square. Leave on the left green lanes, right and right Highbury New Park, left Highbury Grove, right St Paul's Road, left and right Highbury Corner, left Upper Street, Right Barnsbury Street, left Milner Square, four Milner Place, forward into Gibson Square. Thornhill Square to Queen's Square. Leave by Matilda Street, right Copenhagen Street, left Caledonian Road, left Carnegie Street, right Muriel Street, four Rodney Street, four Penton Rise, four King's Cross Road. Right Acton Street, left Grayson Road, right Guildford Street, left Guildford Place, four Lambs Conduit Street, right Great Ormond Street, forward into Queen's Square. Chancery Lane Station to Rolls Road. 
Leave on the left High Holborn, Forward Holborn, Forward Holborn Circus, lead by Charterhouse Street. Right Farringdon Street, for Ludgate Circus, Forward New Bridge Street, Forward Blackfriars Bridge, for Blackfriars Road, left Southwark Street, right Southwark Bridge Road, left Marshalsea Road, for Great Dover Street, comply Bricklayers Arms Roundabout, lead by Old Kent Road, left Rowcross Street, left the White Rolls Road. Pages Walk to St Martin's Theatre. Leave on the left Grange Road, for Bermondsey Street, left Long Lane, right Great Dover Street, for Marshalsea Road, left Southwark Bridge Road, right Great Suffolk Street, left Weber Street, left The Cut, right Waterloo Road, comply Tennyson's Way, leave by Waterloo Road, for Waterloo Bridge, for Lancaster Place, for Aldwych, left Catherine Street, left Exeter Street, right Wellington Street, for Bow Street, for Endell Street, left Shelton Street, right Mercer Street, comply Seven Dials, leave by Mercer Street, left Shaftesbury Avenue, left West Street, set down on the left. It's possible to call much faster than that, and I'll give you examples of calling at two minutes for four runs and faster than two minutes for four runs. Manor House Station to Gibson Square. Leave on the left green lanes, right and right Highbury, Newport, left Highbury Grove, right St Paul's Road, left and right Highbury Corner, left Upper Street, right Barnsley Street, left Milner Square, forward Milner Place, forward into Gibson Square. Thornhill Square to Queen's Square. Leave on Matilda Street, right Copenhagen Street, left Caledonian Road, left Garnegie Street, right Muriel Street, for Rodney Street, for Penton Rise, for King's Cross Road, right Acton Street, left Grayson Road, right Guildford Street, left Guildford Place, for Lambsquare, Jewett Street, right Great Ormond Street, forward into Queen's Square. Chancery Lane Station to Rolls Road. Leave on the left High Holborn, forward Holborn, forward Holborn Circus, for Charter House Street, right Farringdon Street, for Ludgate Circus, for Bridge Street, for Blackfriars Bridge, for Blackfriars Road, left Southwark Street, right Southwark Bridge Road, left Marshall Street, Road, Fort Great Dover Street, and by Bricklayers Arms Roundabout, leave by Old Kent Road, left Rogal Street, left the right Rolls Road. Pages Walk to St Martin's Theatre. Leave on the left Grange Road, for Bermondsey Street, left Long Lane, right Great Dover Street, for Marshalsea Road, left Southwark Bridge Road, right Great Suffolk Street, left Weber Street, left the Cut, right Waterloo Road, and by Tennyson's Way, leave by Waterloo Road, for Waterloo Bridge, for Lancaster Place, for Aldwych, left Catherine Street, left Texas Street, right Wellington Street, for Bow Street, for Endall Street, left Shelton Street, right Mercer Street, and Plyce and Darcy, by Mercer Street, left Shaftesbury Avenue, left West Street, set down the left. And now begins your daily routine. Now you're going to start calling over. And that's what I'll explain to you next. Calling over the runs, reciting them every single day. This is going to become part of your routine and it's unavoidable. You are going to need to call over the runs you do. The runs you're doing will only go in your short term memory. So any time that you leave these runs behind and don't call them over, you'll forget them. They have to be used on a regular basis. You're going to hopefully use them every single run at least once a week and maybe around about twice a week when you're first starting. When you first start, it's fairly easy because you only have four runs a day to call over the four that you did yesterday, but it soon gets up and up. By the following day, it's eight and then it's 16 and then it's 32 and then it's 80. So you soon end up with 80 runs to call over. Those 80 runs should take you one hour to call over, broken into two half an hour sessions. So for 30 minutes, call over, and you should hopefully be able to call 40 runs in that time. Have a small break and then do it again. Call another 30 minutes and you should be able to call the other 40 runs. Now that's only one blue book, and that's the easiest part of the knowledge, is getting that first blue book and getting the standard of call over up to scratch. Then it steps up a level because you're now attempting to learn a second book. Whilst you're learning this second book, you cannot put the first book to one side. So you're going to need to call both of them for the moment. So when you've called the first one, you come home the next day and you're now calling one book plus four runs that you've done from book two. Then it's eight runs from book two. And what you would generally do here is you'd reach a book and a half. Once you've done book one and half of book two, you can split them onto alternate days. So today I will call book one and tomorrow I will call the half of book two that I've done. At the same time, I'm continuously trying to learn the other half of book two. And the runs that you're learning are brand new. The four runs that I've done today, they need to be called every day whilst you're learning them to get them up to scratch. Once you've completed the second half of book two, you can now call book one and book two on alternate days. Seven days a week, never miss a day. Every day, one hour of your day, the very first thing you do generally in the morning is to call over for half an hour, have a break, half an hour, stop. So you would have called the whole module in that hour's time span. Now it steps up another level. You're now about to start learning book three. And at the same time, you're calling book one and two on alternate days, but the first half of book three, you're calling every single day whilst you're learning it. So you've got to fit this in. So your hours revision is turned into an hour and a half every day. So eventually you finish the first half of book three. When you've done that, you can put that onto the third day. And now you're calling book one today, book two tomorrow, and half of book three on the third day. But at the same time, you're trying to learn the second half of all of book three. And this process goes on until you get to book four. 
and then eventually you reach the stage where you can call book one, book two, book three, and book four over a four day period. And on the fifth day, you don't rest. It goes back to the beginning and you start at book one again. And that's your call over regime. Day in, day out, you're going to be calling blue book runs. Don't stop. Don't miss a day. Stick with it. Keep the fluency because once you get the fluency, it's easy to keep if you keep calling over, but very easy to lose if you stop calling over. If you go on holiday, keep calling over. Never, ever miss a day of calling those runs. Your fluency is a key part to the way that you will think, the speed of thought you'll have when you're trying to process point to point. And you're going to speak clearly when you're speaking to an examiner because of the fluency from the blue book. So keep that going. Let's imagine that you're trying to remember a deck of tarot cards. Let's break them into four sets. So you've got 12 tarot cards, then another 12, then another 12, then another 12. So you're going to remember the order of these tarot cards. Imagine how difficult that's going to be, especially when you don't know the name of any of the tarot cards. You've got to learn that first. So unlike a deck of cards where you already know that it's four sets of the same thing repeating itself just by hearts, clubs, diamonds and spades. With tarot cards, you're going to have to learn individual names. It's a completely fresh start. So imagine you was about to remember that. And every time you learn 12 tarot cards, you learn the order of those cards. Do you really think it's a good idea to attempt to learn something else outside of this pack of tarot cards you're trying to learn? As if you had the capacity to learn something else and then come back and carry on learning the tarot cards as if it was easy. Learning a deck of cards, just a plain deck of cards, is hard. And you're doing that every day when you do four runs. And every time you try to do something else on top of that, such as learn points in a quarter mile radius, every time you do that, you're increasing the amount of information you want to try and take in. It's not getting done for nothing. You are going to spend time physically driving around a quarter mile radius at the start and at the end. That's going to cost you between 30 minutes to an hour of your day. And that means you're not doing another run. So by doing that, you are sacrificing doing a run. You're not getting extra done. You are sacrificing doing something else. Now, the thing about this something else is it's a completely different subject. You can study the runs and you can study the points, but the runs involve your short term memory and need to be revised often. The points involve revision, but they will involve your long term memory. And once they are remembered, they're kind of done. They will stay with you for a longer period of time. So there's two completely different disciplines here. The other thing is the points of interest are on the roads that you've learned. So if you knew the roads, the points of interest by degree become easier to learn. Then the aspect of these points in terms of which ones are important and which ones are not. If you find points at the very first day that you start doing Manor House Station at Gibson Square and you're going to carry on doing points that way, you are going to take a hell of a lot longer to complete the runs, which means the points that you found on day one are now quite old and may have gone, may have changed names or may no longer be important. So you have learned that stuff for no reason at all, because it's no longer important to the knowledge at this present stage in time. And this is the thing about points. They need to be relevant to today's knowledge. And if you're going to spend one or two years doing your blue book runs, then basically the information that you did at the beginning is now one or two years old and it can be out of date. The other thing is this. Generally, the schools go for an idea of putting a symmetrical amount of points on each map. We don't do that at WISAM. We put as many points in the area as we think are important. And if it's a very weak area, we put every single point that we think has been asked ever. Whether you find them or not is up to you. But the fact is that if you was to do a map in Mayfair, there is hundreds of points that are relevant today. So if I ask you to find eight, it's not really that relevant in terms of the amount that's in the area. You're just finding eight. If I give you a much weaker area, which would be maybe down near Mitcham Lane, and I give you another eight points to find down there, when there basically isn't anything that's being asked at all in that area. And if it was asked, it hasn't been asked for many, many years. So by doing that, you're now finding eight points that are not important, eight points only in Mayfair when there are a vast amount more important in there. So really, you should be doing the points based on importance. There's going to be about 3,000 different points asked on 56s. And there is about six to seven thousand points asked on 28s and 21s. So you need to know exactly what three thousand you should be finding. And the three thousand you should find are the ones asked the most right now in the time that you're coming up for your appearances. If you're finding points from one or two years ago, they may no longer be relevant. 
Also, you want points that are asked frequently as a beginner. As you get more advanced, you can start taking care of the lower numbers. I have heard people say the examiners can ask you anything. It's true, they can ask you absolutely anything, but they're most likely gonna ask you something they've asked before, most likely. So if you're going through this and you don't yet know BBC Rehearsal Studios, then you're in trouble because it's at the third most asked point of all time. So you need to make sure you at least know these points because the odds of you being asked them, the statistical chance of you being asked them is very high. Whereas the odds of you being asked something very, very small, Oliver Plunkett Chapel, for example, the odds of you being asked Oliver Plunkett Chapel in today's knowledge is pretty slim. Now, if they see this video, maybe they'll start asking it and become a popular point again. But it was a popular point back in the 80s and 90s. It hasn't been popular since. The kind of illusion here is that doing two jobs at once, you are killing two birds with one stone. And you're not. Quite simply, you're not. You are literally doing two jobs. And those two jobs will take twice as long. And there are very few examples, none that I can think of, where it's quicker to do both these jobs by intermittently changing between the two. It's always faster to finish one job and then move on to the next. And especially that the second job actually has a foundation that's built upon the first job. So if you knew roads, points are easier to learn. Uh, the metaphor we usually use is building a brick wall. You are going to build a brick wall that's 3,500 bricks. Do you lay 50 bricks and then paint those 50 bricks and then lay another 50 bricks and paint those 50 bricks and carry on like that? Or do you build the whole wall and then paint the whole wall? Just think about it for a second, that the fastest way that you're going to achieve the overall goal, is it to do it bit by bit swapping between the two jobs or to do one thing completely and then do the other thing that is actually on top of the completed job that is the wall. By separating the two jobs and getting one job done first and then doing the second job after, it is the fastest way to achieve the overall goal. You need to find the points that are actually important. You do not want to be finding a point that was asked five years ago. You want to be finding stuff that's asked now. You also want to be finding the points that have been asked frequently. So really, as a beginner, anything less than 20 times or more, you shouldn't really be bothering with. 20 times or more is going to amount to about 3,000 points anyway. They're the points that you need to be finding. Now, if you take this particular map as an example, on this particular map, when the filters are set to zero, everything's open. There are 17 points of interest that it's asking you to find. Now, if we change that filter and turn it to just being every single point this year, there are now 11 points to find. And then if we change it again and make it everything that's asked 20 times or more, there are now 10 points to find. So the 10 points you want to find are those. You do not want to be finding the 17 because that 17 is going to contain a lot of points that are just not relevant to today's knowledge. So be smart with the way that you go pointing. You are a beginner. You need to be finding the most popular points. Let's look at the arguments put forward as to why you should do the points when you're doing the runs. One is, it's what TFL suggests you do. Well, that's a suggestion they've always made. And that's the same thing that students who studied the knowledge 50, 60 years ago did. They've always said it. Do the dumbbell system. Search the court radius. Now, back then, they had 468 runs to learn. And they used to complete the knowledge in seven months completely. So how did they do that? They basically chased the questions that were being asked by the examiners and copied their friends because the questions were the same. Now, sadly, or excitedly, whatever way you want to look at it, the questions now are hard. The amount of questions we have and the amount of points we need to find is much more greater than it was then. So you've got a real load of work on your hands. But the technique that they're suggesting you did back then doesn't apply now. It does not work. It's not the way that you should do this and learn this a vast amount of information. You need to use a little bit more modern techniques that involve how memory works and how you can cope with this vast amount of information and basic logic. The logic is that 3,500 road names to start learning is already quite a task. And I'm always shocked when I hear people think that they can actually do something else at the same time. One of the arguments as well is that if you're there, if you're at Manor House Station, you may as well have a look around. That is such a bad idea because the run itself you're about to do is you looking around. You are about to do four runs. Why do you want to cloud the images that you're going to create of those four runs with an area at the start or the finish of that run? You're going to magnify the amount of information you're trying to take on board when already the four runs is really difficult to learn. 
So why are you having a little look around and clouding yourself with images from something that you don't actually know whether you need or not? And many of these quarter mile radiuses are going to involve you driving around roads that are actually not necessary to learn. So when you've done the 3,500 road names, we can start filling in whatever gaps it may be that we've got with our knowledge later. But please keep in mind that this task of 3,500 road names is a very difficult task in itself. Why do you think you should or could learn something else at the same time? One of the most common arguments I've heard people say is that if you don't do the points whilst you're there, you're going to have to go back later, kind of insinuating that you're going to run all the runs again. You're not, certainly with the method that we're doing. For a start, the radius maps are geographically arranged. They're not arranged manner of station at Gibson Square unless you want to do the Blue Book method of pointing whilst you're doing the Blue Book, which we don't encourage you to do. They're geographically arranged. And this idea that you're going to have to go back as if going back is a hindrance. It's actually an absolute necessity. Do you really think that you can drive around London once doing the runs and the points at the same time and you go home and it's all hunky dory, it's all taken care of, it's done? It's not going to happen. You do need to make another visit. You will meet, need to make several visits. So by doing the points and the runs separately, you're going to make that second visit and you're going to enhance what you learned from the first visit of those roads that you've been on. But you're going to be finding points that are specific and relevant and you're going to be finding them based on their geographical position so that it's going to be very quick to get around and find them. It's certainly going to be far quicker than had you went out and found points that no one asked in the order of Manor Station to Gibson Square and then went home and tried to study that because going home each night and trying to study these blue book runs alone is going to be difficult. So now you're going home if you've done points and you're trying to study both these things. Again, you're wasting your time. Currently, what we do is when a student finishes their blue book runs, they then go on to doing points and they will do it from the Wiz Radius app or the Wiz Radius paper books, ideally from the Wiz Radius app, because it takes care of the revision aspect, which is quite complicated to do on your own. Once as a beginner that you have completed your points from the Wiz Radius app, you step up to the Wiz Points app and on the Wiz Points app, you can see everything that they're currently asking. You can see how often they've asked it. You can filter out everything that they've asked. You can look at the stuff that's 20 times or more and you can go and visit it based on its geographical position just by choosing it from the map. If you want to know about the Wiz Radius app or the Wiz Points app, you can watch that in our next videos where we'll be doing a full educational tour of both those apps. There isn't a single justifiable intelligent reason why you should do the points at the same time as doing the runs. There is none. The runs themselves are difficult and when you've done all the runs you'll go and find points and those points will be on those runs and those points you go to find will be the most asked at that moment in time so you're finding the correct points. That's the secret to doing this knowledge quickly. You do not want to be doing something that is a complete waste. You cannot just go out and find anything. You need to find specifically what they're asking and they may ask something completely new. That's true. You cannot know everything, but you can know the stuff they're asking the most. And as they ask something completely new, because you've already took care of the business end of the points, you can start going out and finding the other stuff that they're asking that's less and less popular to cover those bases. But first of all, let's find and know all of the big and large stuff that they ask often. And there's a lot of it. There's 3000 of these points that they ask more than 20 times. So let's go and find those. Don't do the points while you're doing the runs. A very common question is, should I learn the runs before I go out? Or should I learn them when I come back from driving the run? Now, you can do that, but it's not the most time efficient way of achieving your goal. If you was to learn the name of 20 people that you're about to meet at a party, it would take you physically longer than if you met the people at the party and attempted to remember their names whilst you're there. So if you're going to drive the run, it's going to take you less time whilst you're driving it to then come home and revise it and learn that run to the depth that you want to understand it to. Whereas if you did that whilst at home before you went out and drove the run, it has no relationship to any memories and it will be harder to actually absorb that run and you're going to take longer while sitting at home to get the fluency. Then you go out and drive the run. The overall time that would have taken you will be longer. So you are better off going out, driving the run, learning in the technique that we've shown you within this video, then coming home and revising and making sure you've got the fluency and the callover standard that you're trying to meet. 
Another common question is, can I learn more than 16 runs a week? And of course, yes, you can. It's entirely up to you, but you've got to make sure you're learning them. Doing 20 runs a week, 24 runs a week, or even 28 runs a week is not easy. You need some time to absorb what you're learning, and you must be reaching the standard of callover that we've pointed out in this video. The absolute key is, can you call these runs? If you can drive them as quick as that and learn as many runs as that in a week and still be able to call them, that's fantastic. By all means, go ahead and do it. But in most cases, the people that generally do that don't reach a high enough a standard of callover. So be aware of that. Do as many runs in a week as you can cope with as an individual, but just make sure that you can call them over. Let's cover some aspects about penning on, because the biggest mistake I see here is excessive penning on. By all means, pen on the four runs you've learned today, and maybe the four runs you've learned over the past week. Pen on the most recent runs you've done, but do not sit there penning on 80 runs or 30 runs. It's a waste of time. And very often when people are doing that, they're doing it instead of the main thing they should be studying, which was how they call those blue book runs, practicing and getting their call over level up to a higher standard. But instead of that, they're penning on. So don't waste your time penning on too much. You are going to be penning on plenty when you start doing point to point. By all means, pen on a few runs. But just the ones you've done recently, pen them on before you go, pen them on when you come back, pen on the ones you've done this week. But beyond that, don't lose focus of what you're trying to achieve, which is calling those blue book runs, calling them fluently and to a very high standard. Anything that detracts from you doing that is a negative thing. Should you do the whizlings? Should you do the reverse runs? And the answer is quite simple. No, you shouldn't. Basically, by doing the runs forwards, by doing all 320 runs forward, you have learned around about 3,500 road names. Many of them are going to be incorporated in the Whizlinks and the reverse runs. A lot of those runs, the Whizlinks and the reverse runs, are going to be able to be answered just by deduction. Some won't be, but a lot of them will be. So one of the first things you can try anytime you get the inclination to do it is to actually start doing point to point with the reverse runs and with the Whizlinks. And you can use the written run as a reference to what you were trying to achieve. So you just read through it, see if what you've done you think is okay, and carry on. So you don't need to do the reverse runs, and you don't need to do the whizzlings. You can test yourself on them afterwards by running them as if they were point to point. And you can do this at any stage. So if you've only done 80 runs, ask yourself the question, how could you get from Thornhill Square to Gibson Square, for example, a, a whizzling in reverse? Ask yourself, how do you get from Gibson Square to Manor Station and you do the run in reverse? So you can test yourself, begin to test yourself as if it was point to point. So don't start getting in the habit of learning a, an abundance of preset recorded runs that you've learned off by heart. Start to develop the skill of your power of deduction of how you would calculate a route and how you would get from A to B. In a nutshell, the five things we've discussed in this particular video are one, make a study plan. Make a study plan and stick to it. It makes a hell of a difference to you psychologically. It gives you a great target. You feel your progress being made. Two, the way you use the map book, don't have the map book on your board. Keep it with you and open it whenever questions arise. Three, visualization. Visualization is utterly unimportant. It takes care of itself. But what doesn't take care of itself is your ability to call the run. That needs your focus and that needs you to practice and do that every day. So call the run, make that your priority. Four, do four runs a day, four days a week and finish 16 runs a week. You will finish a book every five weeks. You'll also finish all 320 runs in 20 weeks and it's a great target to aim for. When you're driving each run, drive four roads at a time. Every four roads, stop and learn those four roads and then drive another four and add them together to make eight. Keep doing that so you're able to call the run and learn it whilst you're out there. Come home and then revise. Five, don't do the points. Doing the points is going to hinder your progress greatly. It doesn't have a single advantage to doing the points whilst you're doing the runs. You are about to learn 3,500 road names just by doing the blue book runs. Why did you want to try to do something else? What made you think that you have the capability of learning something else at the same time? And the major difference is this. The runs you're doing are absolutely necessary. The points, you don't know which points you need to find. And we can tell you that afterwards. So let's get the runs done and let's make sure you're good at those runs. Okay, good luck.
Thank you for watching. I really hope you enjoyed our content and if so, make sure to check out the other videos on the Wizan YouTube channel and be sure to subscribe so that you can keep up to date with any new video releases we may do. If you've got any questions or queries, please put them in the comments below. I'll make sure that I answer them and everybody can see. From all at Wizan, we wish you the best of luck.